We get into the Advent season. John is a big part of that often. Uh, we remember that he is preparing the way for Christ. You know, I was thinking this week, uh, if you go online, you can find all sorts of stuff. And one of the things that you can find are these quizzes that are called Who Am I Quizzes. I didn't realize that they're really as important or used a lot by, you know, psychologists and coaches, uh, you know, life coaches and things of that nature. But uh, you can go online and you can do these life quizzes and they're supposed to tell you who you are. And uh, I don't know how accurate they are or how valuable they are, but I do know that it is a challenge to go through life without a well-developed sense of self-awareness. Now, I'm not trying to get into new agey stuff and, you know, but we need to know who we are. And I think that's really important as believers that we understand who we are because it really helps this self-awareness, this understanding of who we are will really help us as we face changes in our lives, as we face circumstances in our lives, as we enter into relationships in our lives. We really need to know who we are. And that's especially true for Christians. We need to understand who we are in Jesus Christ. Well, in John chapter one, uh, John the Baptist was given a who am I quiz. You know, maybe this is the original one that we have right here. And in uh, uh, chapter uh, one, verse 22, John is asked the question, who are you? Who are you, John? And uh, it's clear from his answer, he knew who he was, and he also knew who he wasn't. So it's really important that we look at that portion of scripture, I think, this morning. So it's in uh, John chapter 1, verses, so we're going to look at verses 6 to 9. We've looked at those in the past verses, and then we're going to look at verses 19 through 23. And if you have, um, you know, one of the few Bibles, you can turn in that. It's on page uh, 1109, 1109 in the Pew Bibles, if you want to follow along, which will help you, I hope, as you uh, listen to the sermon this morning. So verse uh, 6, chapter 1 of John. There was a man sent from God, and his name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Verse 19, if you want to slide down there. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He, uh, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? Or are you the prophet? He answered, no. And finally, in verse 22, he says, finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. Uh, what do we say? What do you say about yourself? John replied in word, the words of Isaiah, the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. So as we've said before, John knew who he was. Uh, he knew he was a human being, but he wasn't ordinary as we see in verse six. There was a man sent by God. He was not an angel, he was not a divine spark. He wasn't any you know, being of that nature. He was just a plain old ordinary man. And uh, there was nothing significant about his name, very common name. Uh, it wasn't significant, uh, it wasn't a significant name like uh, Emmanuel or Jesus that are full of meaning. John was just plain old John. Uh, he uh, virtually stood alone. He did not fit the mold, did he? He, was, uh, he wasn't a Pharisee, he wasn't a priest, he wasn't a Levi. But uh, as we mentioned before, Jesus said that he was the greatest man ever born to that point. Uh, greater than Abraham, Moses, David, Elijah, and uh, Luke chapter uh, 7, uh, verse 28 says, I tell you, John is greater than any other person ever born, but even the least important person in the kingdom of God is greater than John. So Jesus called him the greatest man ever to be born at that time. 
Why is that? Well, we can assume it's because he was sent by God, and he was sent by God with a very, very important message. And that message was an important message. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. Prepare, make uh, the path straight for the coming king. The Messiah is coming. And uh, Jesus uh, says that uh, we are greater. Uh, he says that anyone who comes to faith and is part of the kingdom of God and believes in God and believes in Christ and becomes a member, a citizen of the kingdom of God, he is greater than John. Why is that? Because as we read in the scriptures, we are sent by God also. And I quoted some scriptures for you that said, you know, go and make disciples, uh, go and be witnesses in Acts chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 28. We read, we are sent. There's no doubt about it. But we are sent with an even more important message than uh, John the Baptist had. We come with the message saying, the Messiah has come. And through faith in Jesus Christ, you become a member of the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ then is being identified. We identify Jesus Christ as the Messiah. We identify that through faith, you can enter the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So we have a greater message than even John. We're not greater people, but we have a greater message than what John had to say. So we are human, but we are not ordinary. And we need to understand that about ourselves. We are sent by God. Uh, you know, John appeared to be an ordinary person, right? In many ways, he was maybe even looked like a beggar in that society. Uh, but again, he was no ordinary person because he was sent by God. And it was God that made him an extraordinary person, right? It really wasn't anything John did in particular except that he was sent by God and he was obedient to what God called him to do, to give the message that God had called him to do. And it is God that makes him extraordinary, and it's God that makes us extraordinary. It's nothing that we in ourselves uh, uh, do to make ourselves extraordinary or extraordinary in the kingdom of God. It's only through faith, through believing, through receiving. It's nothing that I do except those things. It all depends. What makes me extraordinary is what Christ has done upon the cross for me. So the same is true of John. The same is true of me. I'm extraordinary in that sense. I've been sent. I'm a servant. I have a job to do. And it is God that has commissioned me. It is God that has allowed me to enter into his service through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we know that John was a, was a human, and, uh, but he wasn't ordinary. Uh, we know that he was a lamp and not the light. And that's what we see in verse 7. It tells us why John came. It says he came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. And Jesus talks about John in John chapter 5, verse 35, as, as the lamp that burned and gave light for a while. So John came to be a witness, and we talked about that. He had one goal in mind. It was to have people turn around to face the light, to see the light. That's what he wanted them to do. He wanted them to point them to the light. And he knew he wasn't the light, verse 8, tells us that uh, he himself was not the light. He came only to witness to the light. So John knew that he was not the true light that we see in verse 9. He knew he was not that light. He was sent to be a witness to the true light. So John realized he was a lamp, but he wasn't the light. You know, in our home, we have a variety of different lamps. I don't know about your home, but I know that it's the case. And over the years, we've had different lamps. We have desk lamps, we used to have swag lamps, we have a chandelier in our, in our uh, dining room. Uh, there's all kinds of desk, you know, I have all, man, I have all kinds of lamps in my home. And they're made of different material, right? There are some brass, ceramic, uh, plastic, wood, all different kinds of lamps in our home. And some are expensive and some are cheap, right? Probably you buy for a couple of bucks and some are 
very expensive because they were gifts to us over the years and and uh, you know we treasure them because of the you know the value of the friendship and uh, that's represented in them so the the important thing about a lamp and the reason you buy a lamp well you may buy it for you know what looks good in that corner but you buy it because you want the light right you just don't buy a lamp and put it in your backyard or you don't you know put it in the attic or something like that unless you don't like it but you know you usually buy a lamp because you need the light it's the uh, the important thing about the lamp is the light right it's not the fixture it's not the fixture that holds the light bulb it's the glow of that filament it's the the glow maybe of the gas that's in a in a you know a, a fluorescent light or something of that nature that lights up a room that's the important thing it's not the fixture it's not the shine of the fixture. Well, I bought that light because it's really shiny. It's going to light up that corner. Well, you buy it because of the light, the nature of the light that's in there. And uh, what John is saying, what he says about himself, is true about us. We are simply fixtures, right? We're lampstands. That's what we are. It's what's in us that creates the light, again, our dependency upon God. Is the light of Christ in our life that creates the light? Is the presence of God in us? I was thinking of the Shekinah glory. And that's a, it's, it's not a term that you find in the Bible, but it's really talking about the presence of God that they was seen in the tabernacle. And, uh, you know, the angels had the Shekinah glory about them. And, and we're talked about in the scriptures that we have to express the glory of God. It's talking about the presence of God. See, that's what gives the light in our lives. <clears throat> and what we need to do is to cultivate the presence of God in our lives through our obedience to God, through our, our love of God. Uh, within us, we have the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. When through faith in Jesus Christ, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And that is what gives us our light. And we allow that light to, to shine in our lives through our obedience to God, through cultivating the presence of God, through prayer and worship and the study of God's word and desiring to know God, desiring to, to experience his presence in his life. So the switch to the light, to that fixture that I am, is uh, turning to faith in Jesus Christ and being obedient to his word, to the word of God, to, to the prompting, to the leading of the indwelling spirit in my life. That's the switch. So if I want to know how to brighten up my life, it comes through obedience. It's knowing God. That's my purpose, and that may mean I need to study more, pray more, fellowship, whatever it is. But the purpose is to brighten that light. So I need to know that I am a sinner saved by grace and that I've been sent to witness to the true light. But I have to make sure that I don't put a shade on that light, right? As a believer, Christ talked about putting a bowl on it. And, and we talked about that a little bit, you know. And we need to let that light shine clearly in our life. So he knew who he was, and hopefully we know who we are, but he knew what he wasn't. And that's where we get into chapter uh, verses 19 and, and following. And so it, knowing who we are is important, but it may be more important to know who we are not, right? And think about that, you know, there are times in your life where you're going to be asked to do something, and you have to say, well, you know, I can't. You got to know your boundaries, right? You know, uh, uh, I, I I try to do that in some relationships. I know that you know in, in Jane's family in particular, uh, I have to have some boundaries because I know that if we, you know, if I 
in order to have a good relationship, we, we need these boundaries. We have to say, well, no, we can't get involved in that. And they might ask us to do that, but we know that if we get involved in that, that it's going to be a mess. And, and so you really have to know what you're, you have to know what you can do and what you can't do in your life. And, and John is really talking about that. John knows who he is and, and, and what he's capable of, but he also knows what he isn't and what he's not capable of. And so that's what he talks about here. So in verses uh, 19 and following, a delegation comes out to John the Baptist. So a group of, you know, come out to, from Jerusalem, you know, they prayed out to the desert where John is baptizing people, and uh, it's made up of Levites and priests, as the scriptures says. And we really aren't too sure what motivates them. Are they afraid of John the Baptist? Man, this guy's up setting the apple cart. This is going to cause a lot of problems for us. Uh, are they just genuinely want to know what who is this guy so that they can join the movement and, and go back to Jerusalem and say, yeah, this guy's genuine. We, we got to listen to what he has to say. We don't know what motivated them. Uh, we know that John's opinion of them, if you read in the scriptures, he once called them a, a bunch of snakes. <laughs> whether they knew that and they were coming up because they're mad and they wanted to you know you know get a get a you know handle on this guy but John we don't know why they came out to see John so they have a discussion with John and we see that in verses 19 through to 24 uh, they wanted to know who he was as we read in verse 19 and so they went through a list and the first thing they asked him uh, that we see in verse 20 or implied in verse 20 are you the Messiah uh, you know, are you the promised, are you the Messiah who is going to deliver us from the bondage of Rome and sin and whatever else they were to have in their mind? And John clearly says in verse 20, I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. Uh, and there were people in that day, and the reason probably John, the apostle who wrote this letter, uh, puts this in here is because there were people in that day that were trying to worship John the Baptist, and that's, you know, what was taking place. Uh, they thought, well, this guy has got to be the Messiah, so they were worshiping him. So John the Apostle wanted to make it clear that John the Baptist was not the Christ. Then they asked him, uh, are you Elijah? And again, he said, uh, no, I'm not the one. So we read in uh, uh, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, uh, a prophecy. And if you know anything about Malachi, it's the last book in the Hebrew Bible, in our Old Testament. Malachi. And it's kind of like the revelation, the revelation of the New Testament, the revelation of John in the New Testament. It talks about kind of end times and end points. And there was a real interest in it. You know, we have people who are really interested in the book of Revelation, and we should be interested in it. But, uh, you know, people are parsing it and trying to figure out everything in that book. And that was kind of taking place with Malachi. And uh, in Malachi, there is this prophecy uh, about the coming of the Messiah. And it says in verse 5 of chapter 4, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great day, the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. So, you know, he's saying, you know, when Jesus comes, it's going to, or when the Lord comes, it's going to be a dreadful day, and you want to be prepared for that day that uh, he comes, finally comes uh, the day of judgment. So we're going to send Elijah to uh, prepare the way, so to speak. So before the Lord comes, Elijah was going to come. And if you know anything about Elijah, Elijah was a prophet. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 18, he was the one that defended uh, God uh, against the Canaanite deity, Baal. Remember, they called down fire, and it was a you know, great demonstration of the power of God. Uh, you know, Jezebel, all of these characters are part of that story. And you, have, and, uh, you can read about that in, in uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. So he was a significant figure. A significant prophet, a man uh, who's considered a, a very powerful man. So Elijah is going to come back before the Messiah comes. 
So they asked him, are you Elijah? Are, are you that prophet? And he, again, he says, no, I'm not. I am not the reincarnation of Elijah. That's not who I am. And so you think, well, doesn't Jesus say that? You read on in the scripture, he say that. But we go at, and look at Luke chapter 117, and a prophecy is given about him. And it's a, a prophecy that the angel tells him. And it says, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. That's what we read in Luke chapter 1, verse 17. And so here's the angel in the spirit and power of Elijah. And the Bible tells us that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. So he came in the spirit and power of Elijah. And that brings us to that crucial question in verse 22. And it's the most crucial question I guess we can ask even ourselves in our own lives. In verse 22 it says, finally they said, just three simple words to this question, who are you? And that's the uh, critical question. Who am I? And you can think about the implications of that as you think about your own life, your own circumstances. A wife, husband, daughter, husband, you can only give your life to this or not. And this is a crucial point in John's life. It is a critical point in, in our lives that we really have to come to faith with. Who are we? John could have answered and said, well, you know, look at my ancestry. My father was, you know, Zachariah, a great priest, a very faithful family. That's who I am. But he doesn't say that. Uh, he could have told them, uh, I was filled with the Holy Spirit in my mother's womb. Can you match that? Man, I'm a special guy. If you know that way. He uh, could have pointed to his success. Look at you guys. You guys are coming out to see me in the desert. Look at the people that are flocking to see me. I mean, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'm an important guy. People are coming out to see me. They could have talked about his sacrifices, right? That's who I am. You know, I, I'm out here in the desert. I'm not in a nice, you know, room in. Jerusalem, I'm not in the temple, I'm out here eating uh, locusts and wild honey and wearing a, a camel skin coat. Oof, that must have been rough. But anyhow, he could have pointed to a sacrifice. But he just said, I am a voice. I am a voice. Crying out in the wilderness. He is calling people. I'm just a voice calling people to prepare for the Messiah. And he quotes in verse 23 from that a portion of scripture from, uh, uh, from, the, from the Bible, from Isaiah that says, uh, I'm a voice of one calling in the wilderness to make straight the way of the Lord. And that's a quote from uh, Elijah, uh, Elijah 40, verses 30, uh, verse uh, 3 to 5. And it's this quote. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Uh, well, we know back in those days, they didn't have highways like we did. They don't, didn't even really have roads like we do today. Many of the roads Many of the thoroughfares in that day were just simply a rut. Uh, going from one place to another, you picked the best rut, and you got into the rut, and you headed off in the direction that you wanted to go. Um, and so the roads were not really well maintained, and they were pretty rough. Uh, obviously, uh, they, you know, there were no So we, we better make sure the road coming to our community or to Jerusalem, wherever, it better be smoothed out. It better be better prepared. We want the king to have a smooth ride when he comes into our region. 
And John the Baptist says, that's what I'm all about. I'm just a road worker. I'm just out there preparing the way for the king to come, the king of kings to come into this world, into our lives. So John the Baptist says, I am just making a road for God. I'm just making a road for the king. Uh, he doesn't say that, well, I, I, I want to just this. he doesn't say that he is making the road. He is saying, we have to make the road. And when you think about it, because what he's talking about here, he's calling us to make a road in our heart for the king. He's not talking about a physical road. He's talking about a spiritual road. He's just talking about, you know, you need to prepare a road in your heart to receive the king who is coming. Um, and that's what he's calling everybody to do. And it's we who have to make the road for the king, for Jesus in our hearts and in our lives. And we go back to Isaiah. You can see that Isaiah in some ways tells us what's involved in making that road. He says, uh, you know, every valley must be raised up. You know, and hopefully I'm not spiritualizing this too much, but there are times that we, in order to become a believer, I have to understand I need to be raised up. I need to know that I'm lost in sin and that I need to acknowledge that I need God to raise me up. I need the grace of God I need the power of God. I need the sacrifice of Christ that we will remember. I have to stand on that. I have to be raised up by him. And as a believer, there are times in my life when I'm in that valley of depression, when the circumstances are tough, and I need to be raised up again by the grace of God, by the love of God. That's how I make, you know, I got to be continually involved in road maintenance in some ways in my life. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. You know, so mountains, hills, these high places, they need to come down. And sometimes in my life I need to uh, deal with the issues of pride. I need to deal with the issues of self-sufficiency and independence. And I'm a proud person. I can't. You know, I've got to sort of come to the Lord because we know the scriptures say God resists the proud and he welcomes those who are humble, who are contrite. Humility is so important. And I have to do that to become a believer. I have to say I can't do it by myself. But I also have to continue to believe that as a believer. Keep that road level. I need to I need to turn away from them as a as a person and those rough spots in my life where I've uh, given into temptation, where I've given into to uh, sinful habits or, 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 or a relationship that isn't right. You know, I got to smooth that out. You know, I got to understand that that's part of you know I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn from those things and I'm going to you know, make the road smooth for the, for the Lord. And that's what it, it's all about. But initially, that requires faith in Jesus Christ. That requires believing in him with all my heart and soul and continuing to uh, be part of, or we can continue to make that, that road uh, clear so that God can really work in my heart and life. And that's, important as we come to communion because we really want to make it you know sometimes we think where is God you know God isn't you know here God isn't working well we know that isn't true we know that isn't true God's at work it's just that we don't we haven't made the road clear in our lives there's something that you know we need to do in our lives uh to a communion and we think about our lives and we think well have I made the road clear have I knocked down those mountains have I smoothed out those rough places you know I need to make sure that I can really clearly come to know the 
love God in a way that really changes my life. And so that's the challenge today as we prepare for communion, to think about uh, Sing, um, we'll sing a couple of songs just to uh, prepare our hearts and minds for.